Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, the show that takes you on a journey to the automotive world. We talk about the latest news, from new makes and models, to new technology, to all of the must-have options available. Whether you're a fan of the old classics, love the latest models and technology, or have never met a vehicle you didn't want to work on, the GSMC Car Podcast has something for every car enthusiast. Welcome to the GSMC Car Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, David Lucy Mabel. Okay, folks, as you all have been following, as you all have been knowing, for the past two podcasts now, we have been doing a series on the most influential cars from each decade. Um, as you all know from the previous podcasts, the car was invented in 1886 by Carl Benz, and we did the most influential car of the 1880s. Uh, the 1890s was the last podcast, which was the 1894 Jury Motor wagon and then now we have the 1900s we've turned the century this is the 1900s if you all are privy to car history to american history frankly to world history you will know that ford developed the model t in 1908 and it was produced from 1908 to 1927 so yes today folks we are going to be discussing the most influential car perhaps of all time but the most influential car definitely of the 1900s which was the ford model t so buckle your seat belts we are going to be taking a trip back to the past pretend that it is 113 years ago and the first model t has rolled off the assembly line let me introduce you to tin lizzie which was a common nickname of the ford model t so let's get started um and before i say what i'm going to say in this segment in this podcast we are going to be discussing the introduction to the model t the the specifications of the Model T, other cars that were around at the time period, as well as world events that were relevant to shaping this era. And of course, in segment four, we are going to be discussing my personal thoughts. So let's get started. Okay. So really the Model T is such a famous car that it really doesn't need an introduction, but nonetheless, I'm going to introduce it. Um, it was produced from 1908 to 1927. It has the distinction of being the first affordable automobile and affordable obviously is a relative term. Any car is going to be somewhat expensive compared to like, I don't know, a blender or a toaster or like a gallon of milk, but the Model T was instrumental was essential in getting the average American on the road to getting the average person on the road. Because before this, before the Model T, a car would cost almost as much as a house. In some cases, cars cost more than houses because the car was still a fairly new invention at this time period. Think of it this way. Um, the car, the technology for the car had existed for less than 30 years at this point. The car had only been around for 22 years by the time Ford introduced the Model T. And the only car to be mass produced before this was five years earlier, which was the 1903 Oldsmobile Curve Dash Runabout. And even then, that was a somewhat affordable car, but not as affordable as the Model T. Ford capitalized on Ransom E. Olds' invention of the assembly line. He capitalized on it, made it more efficient and that contributed to the cost cutting of the Ford Model T because before this before the assembly line was invented by Ransom E. Olds, who, who started Oldsmobile, and before cars were produced on the Olds, uh, were uh, produced on the assembly line, like the Oldsmobile Curve Dash Runabout, cars were hand built and cars were built to order. 
there was there was not such a thing as a mass produced car. Cars back then were very much like how Rolls Royce is today. Rolls Royce car, there's not like forgive me if this is not a perfect example, a perfect comparison, but um Rolls Royce today is largely hand built custom made to order vehicles. I mean, they've got their models that they build, but you basically have to order one from the factory. It's not like you can just go to a dealership and then there's 50, you know, 60, 70, 100, 1,000 Rolls Royces on the line ready for you to just pick up one, sign a lease, or, you know, get, you know, finance, and then you can drive, you know, away for zero dollars down and 20% APR or whatever, you know, the, the things that they're advertising these days. No, no, no. If you want a Rolls Royce, you have to have the money and you order it from the factory and you get it custom made to your specification, especially if you're going to be buying something like a Rolls Royce Phantom. Well, that's how cars were in the days before the Model T, in the days before the Oldsmobile Curve Dash runabout. If you wanted a car, you had to know the person who was building the car, or at least not know the person per se, but you had to know how you were going to get the car built, essentially. It's, it's, it's difficult to explain. It's as if though, oh dear, it's like you, or, you special ordered the car, and then the factory called you up and then you had it built to your specifications and they were hand built and they were not built quickly because everything had to be made by hand because there was not an assembly line. So the factories built one car at a time and then they sold it, built the next car, sold it, built the next car, sold it. They were they were or they were made to order. You ordered the car and then they built it for you and then they shipped it to you or you picked it up. However, it was done back then. The Ford Model T completely revolutionized that. This was this was the advent of the mass-produced car that you can go to a dealership and then buy one. Or if you really wanted to, you can go, you can you could order it, but you didn't have to. You can go to the dealership and then pick it off the lot and be like, okay, I'm gonna buy this car. This put the average person on the road. And moving on, the in 1999, the Car of the Century competition named the Ford Model T as the most influential car of the 20th century, and dare I say, the most influential car of all time. Did you know that 15 million Ford Model Ts were sold? One of the most sold cars ever as of 2012. In 2012, there was a list that was compiled of the top 10 most sold cars of all time. Even though by that time, the Ford Model T had been out of production for 85 years from 1927 to 2012. And then it had been in, it had been produced, first produced 104 years before that in 1908. It still came in eighth on the list of the most produced cars of all time. That's how many Ford Model T's were produced. 15 million in 19 years. I mean, this, it was, it was something that was absolutely unheard of. When you had car companies at this time, if they built 500 cars a year, that was like, whoa, oh my gosh, that was insane. That was a lot of cars. Ford was building, oh my gosh, tons and tons of cars every day, tons and tons of cars every week, tons and tons of cars every month to a scale that had never been seen before by the world. Ford was a businessman, and Ford knew what he was doing with the Ford Model T. In fact, this is what he said concerning the Model T. He said, and I quote, I will build a motor car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials by the best men hired after the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise, but it will be so low in price that no man making a good salary will unable to own one and enjoy with his family the blessing of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. And unquote. That's what Ford, that's what Ford said about the Model T. Henry Ford, that's what he said about the Model T. He had devised this to be such a car 
that any average person can afford. Any average person could enjoy what was previously, you know, reserved for the elite, owning a car. And in some countries today, I mean, even owning a car is a luxury. But think of it that back then, where most people were getting around either on trains, by foot, or horse and buggy. This was a time where the, the Model T put the average person at, behind the wheel of an automobile, which was absolutely crazy to think about. I mean, this is, this is as if though, this is as if though today with, with the advent of electric cars. I mean, it's like Tesla is putting the average people behind, you know, the wheel of electric cars. I mean, I, as much as I don't like Tesla, as much as I think Tesla will eventually go out of business, but Tesla with his Model 3, which, you know, coincidentally sounds a lot like Model T, but Tesla with his Model 3 is making the electric car affordable to the average person. Whereas previously, and, you know, the decade passed, if you wanted a fully electric car, you needed to shell out some money. But now, you know, the Ford model, not the Ford, the Tesla Model 3 is like, you know, 30 something thousand dollars about the price of an average car. And it's putting the, you know, the electric car in the hands of average people. Ford did the same thing, but with the car itself, putting the car in the hands of average people. You had heard me previously say in the last podcast that the 1890s cemented the eventual death of the horse and buggy. Well, if the 1890s cemented it, then the 1900s were the last nail in its coffin. I mean, after the 1900s, Cars began to take over after the Model T, really. Cars be began to take over, and it was no longer practical to have a horse and buggy. No longer practical. Unless you were Amish and you didn't believe in having a car, a horse and buggy was no longer your mode of transportation after the Ford Model T came out. This was insane. This was ludicrous. This was something that, you know, nobody could have predicted that Ford would have done this in such a grand scale, in such a grand fashion. I mean, the Ford Model T had so many different uses and applications and variants. I mean, you can get everything from a Roadster to a Depot hack to this to that. They made trucks. They made armored cars. They made them in all shapes and sizes for every every segment of the population that you can imagine from police to fire to, to firefighters to regular civilians to school buses to this to that the Ford Model T was applied to everything imaginable because he put it in the hands of the average people he put it in the hands of the average people i mean that's not something that anybody had done before you know carl benz made the car but Carl Benz did not have the vision that Henry Ford had. If Carl Benz was the father of the automobile, then Henry Ford was its school teacher. It taught it to be one of the world's, he taught it to be one of the world's greatest inventions. And that we all have Henry Ford to thank. I mean, Henry Ford was a controversial figure. Don't get me wrong. He was an anti-Semite and he did not treat his workers very, very well. He was a very, very stuck in his ways sort of old man. I mean, he pushed his son, you know, to, you know, incredible pressure. His son ended up dying early, Edsel Ford. I mean, even though Henry Ford was a very controversial character, but one thing we cannot deny was that Henry Ford was the mentor of the, the, the modern automobile. He had a great vision for what the car could be, and he accomplished it and saw it accomplished within his lifetime. And that's something that is absolutely amazing. It's something of romance. I mean, these are things that they teach us in school about the Ford Model T. You don't learn about the Cadillac DeVille in school. You don't learn about, you know, the Ford Mustang in school. <laughs> 
you learn about the Ford Model T because the Ford Model T was so much more than just a car. The Ford Model T was a piece of American history. It was a piece of world history. If the Ford Model T had not existed and nobody had ever come up with that idea, we would be in a very different society today, at least here in America. Because in America, like I said, largest car market on earth, we rely on automobiles. It is rare to find an American person who is old enough, obviously, to have a driver's license, to not have a driver's license. It is rare to find an American person who is old enough to have a driver's license, but doesn't have a car. And it is even more rare to find an American person that's old enough to have a driver's license and has never driven a car. We rely on cars so much here in America, and it is impossible to find an American person that has never been in an automobile or that's never seen an automobile. Unless you're taking the Amish, which we don't count them in this because the Amish, they have their religious convictions. They don't do cars. But even then, some of the Amish, before they have their rumspringa, before they get baptized into the Amish church, they owned cars and they drove cars and they held driver's licenses. So it is, I can say with great confidence to find an American person that has never had some sort of interaction with the automobile. Why? Because Henry Ford made it possible with the mass-produced, affordable automobile in the form of the Model T. So, please stay tuned for segment two, in which we're going to be discussing the specifications of the Ford Model T. What was it like? What made this thing tick? And what, what sorts of things did it do? So, please stay tuned. Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. Okay, folks, so in segment two, we are going to be discussing the specifications of the Ford Model T. This is the time in our podcast where we discuss, you know, things like horsepower, things like zero to 60 times, even though I don't think this is zero to 60 rated because it never made it to 60 miles per hour. But you know, things of that sort. So um, in the last segment, we discussed the introduction to the Ford Model T. And in this segment, we are going to be discussing um, what made it tick. What was it like? So the Ford Model T, and of course, the Ford Model T was produced from 1908 to 1927. So, you know, there were several different variations of the Model T, and they were, they, they had made some updates over the years. So the same Model T that came out in 1908 was not the same Model T that went off the production line in 1927, obviously. So there were some differences. So we're talking about, these were the average Model T specs. You know, there could have been some that were upgraded, there could have been some that, you know, were lighter there could have been some that were slightly faster but this is your average model t probably and your sedan or something so um it had a 2.9 liter four-cylinder engine which you know by today's standards is pretty average size for a four-cylinder engine maybe slightly larger you think four-cylinder engines are maybe two to 2.5 liters i mean this is 2.9 liters so it's you know slightly larger um it had 20 horsepower which, mind you, at the time was, you know, a good amount of power considering that just 10 years earlier, 10 horsepower was considered a lot. So, you know, you doubled the horsepower. Um, it had a top speed of 40 to 45 miles per hour. So it was fairly fast, too, considering the cars of the day. Um, and the engine was capable of running on kerosene, ethanol, 
or gasoline. So maybe this was the world's first flex fuel vehicle. I mean, you know Ford has flex fuel vehicles today, but maybe this isn't such a new technology. Maybe they had this idea hundreds, well, a hundred years ago with the Ford Model T. Who knows? But this... This fuel flexibility was credited to its low-voltage magneto ignition. You know, essentially, the low-voltage magneto ignition was something that I think, like the magneto, which which uh, generated the spark to, to start the car, was integrated into the flywheel. It was something that was more common on stationary engines, not engines in cars, because cars at the time had high-voltage magnetos to run spark to the cylinders and everything. So apparently, the reason why it was flexible on what type of fuel that it used was because of this system, this low-voltage magneto ignition. So, I mean... Yeah, whatever that's supposed to mean. If you're an engineer, I mean, you'll you'll be able to understand that a lot better than I could. I, I am not an engineer. I've got a degree in mass communications, telecommunications, and broadcasting, hence why I'm doing this podcast. I just happen to be a car nut, but I did not study, you know, car engineering or anything of that sort. Heck, I never even took physics because I avoided, like, the play. But then, moving on. It did not need a battery to start. It was hand cranked instead. So cars of this uh, era, known as the brass era or the Edwardian era of automobiles, um, did not have batteries. Cars of this era did not have batteries that needed to run to an electric starter that needed to, you know, start the engine through like a push button or the turn of a key. Cars these days did not have keys. They did not have push button starters. They were hand cranked. So this is how it was operated. There was literally a crank that stuck out from the front of the car. That on some higher end models had a loop that you could rest the crank in, but really it was a crank. And then you took your hand and then you cranked the engine until it started. So you were manually, you you needed to be rather strong for this. And this is why, fun fact of this era, that electric cars also existed. Electric cars were seen as a less manly alternative to the gasoline car. So women motorists of the time period were, you know, electric cars were, were really, I guess, marketed to them because electric cars, with the push of a button, the car started and then you can drive. You didn't have to get dirty. You didn't have to get to the front of the car and you didn't need need to use brute strength to start your automobile. All you needed to do was get into an electric car, press a button, and then you were going. This is this is sort of the stigma of electric cars back then. And I guess if you're a misogynist today, you might still think that electric cars are only for women. They shouldn't be um, for men either. But, you know, I digress. Uh, the, the, the Ford Model T was a crank start engine. In fact... Cadillac, uh, um, which which was not a person, well, Cadillac was a person, but not the, the person who owned the car company, Cadillac. Henry M. Leland with Cadillac um, had invented the electric starter to put in the cars because that, because um, a Cadillac with a crank start, because all cars had crank starts at the time, had backfired. And then the handle had hit the owner in the head, and then the owner died of the head injury, into which Henry M. Leland said he will not have his cars killing people, so therefore he had invented an electric starter for the car. The electric starter didn't come to the Ford Model T until the early 1920s, so the Model T, by far and wide, they were all crank start engines, Um, and if it backfired on you, goodness, the crank would go backwards, which, how that person died, but typically you would end up with a broken arm because I mean you're talking about an engine here that's backfiring and if you didn't hold this crank properly I mean you could end up with a broken arm if it backfired on you so um it was rear wheel drive as most cars were at the time even though the French had developed a front wheel drive car since the 1890s but the French have always been ahead of their game when it comes to cars especially in the early days um and then it was driven by a two-speed planetary uh, gear transmission. Okay, so today we have several different types of transmissions. We typically lump them in the group of automatic and manual, but it's not really that simple. 
you get true manual transmissions in which you have a clutch and then you press the clutch to shift gears and then you release the clutch and the car is in neutral, blah, blah, blah. I only know how to drive a manual. In theory, I don't know actually how to drive one. And then you get automatics in which the shifting is done automatically through the computer the computer senses when it's time to shift the car depending on engine rpms there are variations of the automatic transmission there are dual clutch transmissions dual dual clutch transmissions are cars that have two clutches so they shift faster than a regular automatic that has a torque converter um I, i'm not an engineer so i don't know exactly what the torque converter does all i know is that dual clutch transmissions are not torque converter transmissions they are dual clutch they shift faster and then you get CVT, which CVT means continuously variable transmission. Continuously variable transmissions don't have gears at all. They are belt driven. And the, they, they, they have different ratios um, to drive the belt in the transmission of the car, uh, depending on how fast the engine is going to keep, you know, fuel economy um, in check and to to basically run the car at the most efficient setting possible in the transmission. Those those are belt driven. And then you have automated manual transmissions in which the engine is still, you know, the the the, the transmission is still manual, but you pre-select gears and then it tells you when it's going to go into that gear. So you pre-select the next gear and then it goes into that gear when it's ready to do that. And that the only car I've ever seen that on, it's not really a car, it's a truck. It's the Mercedes-Benz Unimog. And if you watch Doug DeMiro's video on the Unimog, you can see that transmission in action. Um, and uh, this was a planetary gear set. So what a planetary gear set was, was basically there was a larger gear and there was a smaller gear and they revolved around each other. So how that worked in practicality on the Ford Model T. The throttle was controlled by a hand lever on the steering wheel. So these days on your regular car, both automatic and manual, the throttle is controlled by a foot pedal, which we call the gas pedal. There was no gas pedal on the Ford Model T. You had three pedals. None of them were gas pedals. The gas was controlled by a hand crank on the steering wheel. The left pedal was used to engage the transmission. Now get this. If you wanted it in low gear, you fully press the pedal in. If you wanted it in neutral, you brought it up to the middle position. And then if you wanted it in high gear, you didn't press the pedal at all. But here's the catch. The car would only go into high gear if the full if the the gas lever was fully engaged. So you can only put it in high gear while the car was running and the gas, the gas lever was fully engaged. So when you were starting the car, you left it in the middle, in the middle, um, in the middle position. So the car would be effectively in neutral and then you would crank start the car that would cause it to go. That's how the Ford Model T operated. And then the middle pedal was the reverse gear. So if you wanted to go in reverse, you press the middle pedal and then the car reversed. And then the right pedal was the transmission brake. There were no brakes on the wheels. Now here's what a transmission brake was. The transmission brake literally clamped around the transmission, the gears in the transmission, to stop the back wheels from turning. There were no there were absolutely no brakes whatsoever on the front brake uh, on the on the front wheels. It was only the back wheels that stopped because the back wheels were the ones that were being driven by the transmission. So the the the, the transmission brake was a drum that clamped around the transmission to stop the gears from spinning so the back gear the back wheels could no longer spin. There was obviously a handbrake too to be used when parking or to be used in emergency situations. And this one was an actual drum on the rear brake on the rear wheels that, you know, once you engage the hand lever, it stopped the wheels. So that could also be used as an emergency brake. So that's how the Ford Model T operated. So if you did not 
know how to operate this. You would think it's your regular old manual. You had clutch on the far left. You had brake in the middle and you had gas on the right. And then whatever you're, you know, you're, you're, you wouldn't pay attention to the hand levers. That's not how those cars were. Hand lever, gas, and then you had the three pedals that did their three different functions. So that was very interesting. Um, very, very different from a modern vehicle. Um, the Ford Model T could even be, you know, I mean, could even be held in what was a sort of cruise control if you kept it in full advance on the gas pedal and then you, you know, left it in high gear because then you could, you would have no pedals that you were you were uh, pressing in a sense. You wouldn't have to press the brake because the brake doesn't make the car go. You obviously wouldn't press in reverse. And if you disengaged the, the, the left pedal, that meant it was in high gear and then the, the throttle was advanced all the way, the car would cruise because the throttle is advanced all the way and then the, the transmission is in high gear so you didn't have to press any pedals if you wanted to cruise. So it was like an early form of cruise control in a sense. And, you know, Ford Model T wasn't the only car at the time period that did this. This was a common feature. Um, but um, just to point to the versatility of the Ford Model T, the Model T could be modified to be used on railroads and it came with appropriate track width as well. I mean, there was a four and a half foot or yeah four and a half foot track width for northern railroads that you could fit the car with flanged wheels and it would ride on the railroad and in the south the common track width was five feet so you could even get one with a five foot track width to drive on southern railroads the car the ford model t was was you know was used in all sorts of applications, not just, you know, road use, not just for your regular, you know, plebeian everyday uses either. I mean, this car, this car was used in all sorts of fashions for all sorts of things in all sorts of different ways. So those were some of the specifications of the Ford Model T. Um, they, it came in a variety of colors. It wasn't until after 1914 that all of them came in black. But in the first days, they were actually not available in black. You can get them in red, you can get them in gray, you can get them in green, or you can get them in blue, I believe. And then um, from like 1912 and 1913, they were all blue with black fenders. And then from 1914 on, they were all black. And so, yeah, that, the reason why they were all black was because black paint dried the fastest and therefore was the cheapest to produce. So... Yeah, there you have it. Those were the specifications of the Ford Model T. So moving on, we are going to be talking in segment three after the break about other cars and the history of the era. So please stay tuned. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back, folks. So essentially, 
we had other cars um, and the history of the era in this segment. But in the last segment, we had the specifications of the Ford Model T and the introduction to the Ford Model T. So other cars of the era included things like the 1903 Oldsmobile Curve Dash runabout that I already mentioned, but let me reiterate that. Uh, it was the first mass-produced car. Henry um, no, not Henry, Ransom E. Olds, which started the now defunct um, Oldsmobile Motor Company, was the person who invented the assembly line. And he was the first person to mass produce a car using the assembly line. Ford did not mass pro was not the first one to mass produce the car on the assembly line. Ford, however, was the one who made the best use of it. And so there you have it. Um, the, the Oldsmobile Curve Dash Runabout was the first mass-produced car in 1903. Um... 1903 Cadillac Runabout. Of course, I'm a Cadillac fan, so this is this was the very first Cadillac. Um, it's rep it had a very um reliable reputation, and it had a 10 horsepower single cylinder engine. This is the first car that Henry M. Leland made from the remnants of the Henry Ford Company, which later became the Cadillac Motor Company in 1902, and then they produced their first car in 1903. So, yeah, this was the Cadillac of Cadillacs. This was the car that started it all. Cadillac in those days had a reputation for reliability, and they were some of the first cars, if not the first cars, to have fully interchangeable parts. So there was actually a competition that was held and to really test this theory of interchangeable parts on Cadillacs. What they had done, they had gathered a group of five or six cars, they had taken them completely apart, and then mixed the parts, and then put them all back together, and then driven like 60 miles or something like that. And then the cars, which were all Cadillacs, had all held up even after being taken apart and then being put together with different parts from different cars. This was something that was sort of revolutionary at the time because even though cars had begun to be mass produced, you know, a lot of cars were still hand built, hand made, and a lot of cars were still bespoke to whatever the owner wanted. So to find a car that had interchangeable parts that still ran properly and was reliable after using parts from a different car was something unheard of. Today, we take it for granted that cars have interchangeable parts. We take it so for granted, as a matter of fact, that Whenever I need a part for my car, I just go to the junkyard and pull it off of another Buick. Heck, it doesn't even have to be a Buick. It could be a Cadillac. It could be a Pontiac. I mean, we have so many interchangeable parts among so many different brands nowadays that this is something we take absolutely for granted. For example, my girlfriend a couple of months ago needed a new headlight socket for one. No, not a, a headlight socket. It was a it was a bulb socket for one of her turning signals in her front in her front headlamps or whatever. And I go to the junkyard. I'm looking around and I'm trying to find a 2006 or earlier Honda Pilot to get this, you know, part off of. I cannot find one for the life of me. I go to the uh, Acura MDX, which was basically a Honda Pilot with an Acura body, and I go, the they, they had changed the lighting sockets. It wasn't working. I had gone to some other Hondas of the late 90s, early 2000s, couldn't find. You know what I ended up doing? I had a brainchild. I was like, ah, you know what? Let me go check some of the Acura sedans from the 90s. Maybe they might have the same, you know, lighting circuits and lighting brackets and whatnot. And lo and behold, I went to a 1997 Acura RL. First thing I found was the lighting socket that I needed because parts interchangeability. We have Cadillac to think of that, to, to, to thank for that. And the Cadillac, you know, the 1903 Cadillac runabout was the car that started it all. So uh, moving on. And then we had the Mercedes Simplex. The Mercedes Simplex was, this was, these were the days before Mercedes Benz. At this time, Mercedes was the name for DMG, which was Daimler Motor Gelschaft or something like that, some German name. Daimler Motor Gelschaft, uh, forgive me for all the German listeners out there because I'm absolutely butchering your language, but uh, the DMG, the, the name for it, the mark that it marketed his cars under was Mercedes. 
and then Benz had been a company that had invented the car in 1886 run by Carl Benz. It was a separate German car company. Well, this was before the two merged in 1926. Um, this was obviously in the 1900s. There was a Mercedes simplex. This was a very powerful car with 40 to 60 horsepower. We're talking about, in the days, I just mentioned the Cadillac runabout had 10 horsepower. 10 horsepower was was a respectable amount in those days, especially coming from a single cylinder engine. Imagine if it had four cylinders and you had 10 horsepower per cylinder, just like this car had, you would have 40 horsepower. The Ford Model T only had five horsepower per cylinder. And the Ford Model T at 20 horsepower was a respectable number. The Mercedes Simplex had 40 to 60 horsepower. That was unheard of in those time periods. Absolutely unheard of. And it was a very expensive automobile. This was the car that really brought the automobile to like the royal families, the noble families of Europe. Because these people, they had obviously virtually unlimited wealth. They could buy whatever the heck they wanted. So if they were going to buy an automobile, it was going to be a Mercedes Simplex. This was the days before Rolls Royce even. I mean, the Mercedes Simplex was, dare I say, one of the first ultra-luxury sedans that really set, you know, ultra-luxury into, into the market for people. Because in those days, you know, having a car was a luxury in itself for almost all people, especially in Europe before the Model T had gotten there. Now you have these cars... These cars that are ultra luxury cars that are, you know, you know, very nice, very powerful, very well built, very reliable. These are the cars that the rich and famous are going to be flocking to. So the Mercedes Simplex had really set the tone for luxury cars of the era. And there's an obvious reason why I didn't choose any of those cars to do the podcast on, because the Ford Model T absolutely outshines those cars in terms of influence. But I had to mention them. Nonetheless, purely for educational purposes, so you all can know what other cars exist at the time period and basically what the Ford Model T was up against. But really, those cars couldn't hold the candle to the Ford Model T. So let's move on um, to the historical time period. What was going on in history at the time? There was first wave feminism. First wave feminism saw progress. I mean, universities for women opened up in Japan, in Bulgaria, in Cuba, Russia, and Peru. This was a turning point from the 1890s to the 1900s. It's a new century. I mean, people are beginning to, you know, to challenge the notions of traditional gender roles. They're, char- they're beginning to challenge the notions of, you know, what the world had always been. They're beginning to chant, uh, um, um, ch- you know, challenge those notions. And as you all would know, in 1920, American women would gain the right to vote. So this, you know, just like Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, women didn't get the right get the right to vote in a day either. I mean, it was in these time periods and even before this that you know w- w- feminism had begun to grow and to take root, and then women began to see themselves as equal members of society and demand proper rights, not only in the United states but in the world over um over across the pond in england queen victoria died in 1901 up until that date she had been the longest reigning british monarch in all of history she had gained the throne in oh goodness she had reigned for 65 years i believe so she had gained the throne or ascended the throne i should say in 18 Oh, let's see, 1836 or 1837, something along those lines, because she was only about 18 when she ascended the throne, and she was born in 1819, so let's say 18 plus, so sure, yeah, it was 1837 to 1901 that Queen Victoria had reigned over uh, the United Kingdom and the British Empire, really. She was the last Empress of India, and uh, she was one of the greatest British monarchs of all time. She is the great-great-grandmother of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So that was the end of the uh, Victorian era into the Edwardian era in which Edward VII took the throne 
from 1901 to, I believe, 1909, he reigned over England. Um, I believe either from 1901 to 1909 or 1901 to 1910, something along those lines. And then... Um, you had um, the 1906 San Francisco fire and earthquake um, that happened, obviously, out in California. And then you had the Commonwealth of Australia was formed as well. Of course, there were all sorts of other things going on in the world, but so, those were some of the big things that were going on. So not only did you have, you know, cars, you know, making great advances in technology, but you also had, you know, great advances in, in the world. I mean, the... You you know, the, the industry the industry was rising. Um, people like John D. Rockefeller was making his millions back in the day with Standard Oil and everything. I mean, this this was this was a time period to be alive. Late 1890s, early 1900s, everything is changing. Everything is challenging the notions of old. Everything then was thoroughly modern. To quote quote modern Millie, I mean, you know, it was it was. It was amazing. It was an amazing time period, and there were lots and lots of things going on. More so that I could, I could have a whole time, I could have a whole podcast, a whole series of podcasts dedicated to just the late 1890s or early 1900s. But unfortunately, this is only a car podcast, so I just wanted to mention those things to you, just so you can get an idea of what else was going on in the world while these cars were being produced. I mean, think of it: you could buy a Ford. Model Model T, and you can drive in America while Queen Victoria was dying and Edward VII was taking over while feminists were protesting uh, for the right to vote, suffragettes were doing, prohibition was just around the corner. I mean, this was this was a time to be alive. I mean, Italian gangsters in, in New York and Chicago, I mean, you know, colonization of Africa, um, the, the Ottoman Empire still existed. I mean, this was a very, very different world than the world we live in today. So uh, moving on to segment four, y'all are going to hear about my thoughts on the Ford Model T and, you know, my rationale behind picking this particular car for this podcast. So please stay tuned after the break. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. Alrighty, folks, welcome back. So, in the first segment, you heard me talk about the introduction to the Ford Model T. In the second segment, you heard me talk about the specifications of the Model T. In the third segment, you heard me talk about some other cars that existed at the time period that were also influential, and you heard me talk about first wave feminism, um, Queen Victoria dying, other sorts of you know, little historical tidbits that were going on in the time period, um, just to put it into perspective for you all. So now let's get into why I chose this particular car and why I chose to do this podcast on the Ford Model T. Okay, so the 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 reasoning is really obvious here, folks. Um, it's really obvious in the sense that the Ford Model T was 
an amazing automobile. I heard it once said, I don't know if this is true, and if anybody is listening to this and can back this up, um, 55% of the world's cars at some point were Model T's. So that means half, even more than half of all the cars that existed on the planet at the time were all Ford Model T's and some variation of that platform. That is absolutely insane. We've heard of some good selling platforms. I mean, we've heard of the GMB body cars. The GMB body cars were some of the most sold cars on earth. I mean, you've heard us talk about you know, Ford F-150s. Um, that's, you know, the best-selling Ford vehicle. You've heard me mention the Toyota Corolla, which is the best-selling car currently on Earth at the time. But this, this, this is a record that will likely never be beaten because it was such a unique time period and Ford had such a grip on the automobile market because he was so brilliant. He was the first person to come up with the idea of an affordable car, believe it or not. I mean, Ransom Me Old might have mass produced the car before Ford did, but Ford was the first one who thought about putting the car in every driveway in America. This was, this was crazy. And not only in America, the Ford Model T became the first global car as well. They produced the Ford Model T in Brazil. They produced it in the UK. They produced it in Japan. They produced it right here in America, obviously. They produced it all over the earth. There was no way for this car to not be successful because there was some there were some places I can guarantee you the Ford Model T was the first car anybody had ever seen. The first the Ford Model T you could go anywhere on earth and see them at the time you could go anywhere on earth today and probably still see couple in either museums being preserved or heck still being driven around because not gonna lie last year on my way to work when i used to live in tampa goodness guess what i saw i saw a ford model t being driven on bears uh, on bruce b downs boulevard at the intersection of bruce b downs and bears in tampa i saw a ford model t goodness I mean, you can even still see them on the road today. The Ford Model T's legacy is, is, is unshakable. You cannot shake the legacy of the Ford Model T. 55% of the world's cars were Ford Model T's. I mean, like I said, very unique circumstance. Henry Ford was a brilliant businessman. I mean, it's a record that I can say with great confidence will never be beaten. 55% of the world's cars will never be Toyota Corollas. 55% of the world's cars will never be Cadillac DeVille's, will never be Buick Park Avenues, will never be Tesla Model S's, Tesla Model 3's, uh, Hummer EV's, or whatever the, you know, the new crazy foolishness is nowadays. The Ford Model T has it in the bag as for that record at least, and probably the most influential car ever seen and we will ever see is the Ford Model T. I could not have had a complete record and, you know, run with the GSMC podcast on cars if I had not mentioned the Ford Model T and, di and gave it its justice. I have done the Ford Model T its due justice. I've done it its due diligence. The Ford Model T deserved a podcast. And by gosh darn it, goodness, today it got its podcast. Because the Ford Model T is too important for car history not to mention. So there you have it. The Ford Model T was absolutely crazy as far as, you know, how successful it was. I mean, and, and they were well built too. They were well built. You can still find tons of them in running original condition today. I mean, and a Ford Model T, frankly, a Ford Model T ain't too expensive. Even, you know, frankly, you know, all of them are almost 100 years old now. But a Ford Model T ain't too expensive. You can pick up one for like yeah, 15, 20 grand. It's not too expensive. Because they made 15 million of them. They're still pretty common as far as classic cars go. Granted, a lot of them have been chopped up and made into tea buckets and whatnot. But, I mean, you can still find an original condition for a Model T for probably less than $30,000. Which is a steal. Considering that you can own a piece of history.
Now, moving on. Um, wow, I just wow, I just went off on a rabbit trail there. Let me go back to my notes. Um, yeah, like I said, the legacy of the Ford Model T is unshakable. I had to choose this podcast because I was I was debating within myself. I was debating within myself, should I do the Ford Model T or should I do the Oldsmobile Curve Dash Runabout? Because I was like, the Oldsmobile Ford, uh, Curve Dash Runabout was the first mass produced car. First mass produced car. And I mean, it's still, it's one of the most influential cars of the 1900s. And dare I say, it's the second most influential car of the 1900s because it, it, it paved the way for mass production. It was the first car to be produced on an assembly line. If it had not been for the Oldsmobile Curve Dash runabout, the Ford Model T may not ever have seen its day, may have never have seen its success that it did. So, it, you know, it has to thank the Curve Dash runabout as well. But I told myself I had to. I absolutely had to mention the Ford Model T, and I had to do a podcast on it because of how important it was. I would be remiss not to do a podcast on the Ford Model T. So uh, moving on, the legacy is unshakable. Uh, to this day, people are still hot routing Model Ts. I mean, in the decades, in not even the decades, in the years after World War II, let me do some history with y'all. In the years after World War II, people had come back from war and they had money to burn. And so a lot of them, what they would do, they would buy old Model Ts, which at that time, you know, the oldest ones were about 30 something years old. The newest ones were about 20 years old. They would buy old Ford Model Ts and they would tinker with them and race them. Because if you remember um, learning about this at any point during the era of prohibition during the 1920s, the Ford V8 had come out. Ford V8 had come out, was very easily modified and made faster so that they can get away from police who were, who were um, chasing down moonshine runners. And they had modified those cars. Well, those modified cars after the war were the basis for some of the very first NASCAR vehicles. NASCAR has its root in prohibition and the cars that bootleggers would modify so that they would be able to outrun police vehicles. So what the, the soldiers, a lot of the, the GIs from World War II had come back, they had applied those same principles that existed during Prohibition of souping up cars and making them faster. They had bought some old Model Ts, which were a dime a dozen, super cheap, super plentiful. They would buy them and they would hot rod their engines to race them. So... This is basically what started the hot rodding culture was the Ford Model T. The Ford Model T it was integral in the early hot rodders day because it was lightweight. It had the potential for a lot more power out of its engine. And not only that, it was cheap and it was plentiful. So, you know, you couldn't go wrong with a Ford Model T. A Ford Model T, you know, for a hot rodder back then, is kind of like what, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Honda Civic is to, you know, those high school boys that put fart cans on them. I mean, a Honda Civic, good, reliable engine, plenty of potential for power, super lightweight, super cheap, dime a dozen. You can get them anytime, anywhere, especially a late 80s, early 90s Honda Civic for nothing. And then you can easily and cheaply modify it and make it go faster than it was intended to go. I mean, that's the same thing they did with the Ford Model T. You see, human nature does not change. The book of Ecclesiastes does not lie. There is nothing new under the sun. What they did with the Ford Model T back then is what they do with Honda Civics today. They hot rodded them. And so it was it was the beginning of hot rodding culture. I mean, the Ford Model T and the engines were so you know, reliable and so versatile that they were used in a variety of applications up until 1941. They were used in boats. They were used as stationary engines. They were even produced in new form for people who owned Model Ts and refused to get rid of them so they can keep on, you know, maintaining their cars when their cars finally got worn out and they needed a new engine. Up until 1941, you could buy a new engine for a Ford Model T and install it. And I'm sure it wasn't that difficult to install because, you know, it was a relatively simple engine with a few moving parts. I mean, you could probably do that in an afternoon. 
in less than an afternoon. So, I mean, the engine proved a cheap and viable engine for not just hot routers, but for so many different applications. The Ford Model T was a car. The Ford Model T was this. The Ford Model T was that. The Ford Model T was a way of life. And that's not even an exaggeration. I mean, this was this was crazy. And, and, and this was really what spelled the end of the horse and buggy. Because even in the early days of the automobile, the first decade or two, the cars were being produced. But unless you were filthy rich, unless you were rich Uncle Pennybags, you couldn't buy a car. You still had to rely on your horse and buggy or going on foot using trolley cars or using trains to get around. You couldn't go. You couldn't buy your own car unless you were making tons of money. But until Ford came around, this is what ended the horse and buggy. And I wrote in my notes, if the 1890s confirmed the death of the horse and buggy, the 1900s were the last nail in its coffin. That's what it was. So, folks, I just want to update you on our social media um, venturings with the GSMC Car Podcast. Uh, we still have a Twitter account that's at GSMC Car Podcast. And we now have an Instagram, which is at uh, GSMC underscore Car Podcast. Um, last time I checked this morning, we have 39 followers which I believe last podcast we had done a couple of days ago, I think we only had like 21 or something. So we've, we've gained followers, which is good. We have about 39 followers and continue to follow us and comment. And if you comment something that I include in one of my podcasts, I will definitely give you a shout out. I mean, I don't have a reason not to because we still barely have anybody. We haven't grown to that such large of a size to not do it. So please like, comment, Follow especially, and our podcasts are on Spotify, they are on YouTube, they are on the Android app Spreaker, and they are on Apple Podcasts as well, so please follow us all over the place, all over the social media, tell your friends, tell your families, tell your local car enthusiasts, share us at the Cars and Coffee, do something so we can get out on the map, and so people who have an appreciation for cars don't just know about cars of today, but they know about cars of path. They know about cars, you know, in a practical sense, in an artistic sense, and in a historical sense. So this is what I try to cover in the GSMC Car Podcast. So please tell your folks about us. Tell everybody about us. And please follow us back. But back to the Ford Model T. Um, I chose this car because it is near and dear to every car enthusiast. Whether you love it or you hate it, you can't dis you can't deny the fact that the Ford Model T is perhaps the most influential car of all time, and undoubtedly the most influential car of the early 1900s, from 1900 to 1909. And heck, it's probably the most influential car of the 1910s, and the most influential car of the 1920s as well, but for those two podcasts, I'm going to do something different because I already covered the Ford Model T in this podcast. So, um, yeah, this has been the GSMC Car Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Uh, please follow us. Uh, you all heard, already heard my social media plug earlier just a few seconds ago. So please take that to heart. Tell your folks about us. Tell everybody about us. And thank you so much. And have a good night. You've been listening to the GSMC Car Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's episode.